not how this saving fate to me he did impart. Now how believing in his word brought peace within my heart. But I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in him. But I know And I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come at night or noon they fare, nor if I walk the veil with him or me. But I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. And the last song is 483. Now you sound much more better and beautiful. Amen? Amen? Hey, smile and sing. Jesus loves you. And I do too. I need thee every hour. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford.
Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out. We're going to have a wonderful, spirit-filled time tonight. Amen. Amen. Um, can I see the hands of those who are out for the first time to uh, Brother Jeremiah Davis? Welcome, my brother. Okay. Um, we've been having a great time here. And we are so blessed here at Northwest Dade to have our Brother Jeremiah Davis with us. Um, at this time, uh, let's uh, ask, invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. Oh, kind and gracious Father God, great and mighty is your precious name. Father God, we humble ourselves before you, asking you, Lord, to, to just empty us, Father, and just fill us with your Holy Spirit. Father God, I pray that as we um, listen to Brother Davis, I just pray, Father God, that we will put away all our critical way of thinking, Lord, and just open our minds, Father, to the blessing that's in store for us. Father God, we love you, we worship and adore you. Once again, Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity that you have given us. Thank you for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, um, we have um, our special music. It's going to be done by our brother Josiah Ruff, who is um, our, uh, our, direct, our director of music here. So at this time, um, I'm also going to ask for um, those who will be picking up the offering. Uh, please remember that um, Brother Davis is coming all the way from Atlanta to be with us. And, um, pardon me? Alabama. Alabama. See? See, man. See how much I know. You know, okay. I apologize for that. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, of course, uh, expenses involved in his trip here. And uh, we're going to ask you kindly to, um, to dip into your uh, resources and help us here at Northwest Dade to, um, to offset this cost. Um, we are um, asking for the offering prior to him speaking. Uh, because uh, that was a re his request, but um, you know we'll also have um, a plate at the door. You know if uh, if you don't have it now, you'll probably go to your car or something, or you know just call in on your visa or something to make this happen. Okay. So at this time, uh, we'll ask uh, Brother Ruff to come up. Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness. Watch and pray. Find in me thy nod and all. Jesus paid it all. All to him. I owe sin hath left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow since nothing good I have whereby thy grace to claim 
I will wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's Lamb. For Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. My sin hath left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete. I will lay my trophies down, all down at Jesus' feet. For Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. My Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. My sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. My sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed still white as snow my sin had left a crimson stain but he washed it white as snow this time we'll collect the offering after which we'll do our theme song and the next voice you hear will be that of pastor jeremiah davis many new faces we have here tonight that weren't here last night let's raise your hands let me see praise God 
I hope to see some, new, some newer face tomorrow night, and especially the night after, and not to mention Wednesday night. Call that hump week, midweek. It's Wednesday night anyway, we should be at church, right? I hope you've been blessed. I know you've been blessed. I have been blessed. And you'll be blessed even more as you come. Let us come in fellowship and draw near to God. He promises that if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. Let us stand as we sing two verses of I would be like Jesus, the first and the second verses, after which Brother Jeremiah Davis will be speaking to us from the word of God. Father, we're so thankful for your blessings, and we pray that you will be with us as we continue tonight in this week of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to say good evening. You know, it's a blessing for us to be here tonight, amen? And I know that it wasn't easy for you to get here tonight, and I can tell you it's not going to get easier, and I want to remind you tonight that if anything would prevent you from coming to a meeting like this, that you put it before the Lord and pray and ask and say, God, make every possible way that I can be out at every meeting that we have. In fact, I was looking at the rain, the little trink trinkets of the rain. I thought, you know, if the devil can stop them from coming with a little rain, well, he'll send a lot of rain. Yes. But I'm so thankful. If you're here tonight, it's an indication that you're not going to let any rain stop you. Amen. So we want to thank you for coming and to being with us tonight. We're going to continue in our week of prayer. And I reminded you to bring a Bible. You brought your Bible? Amen. I asked you to bring a pen and a paper. Did you bring a pen and a paper? Amen. We want to be able to take notes on what we're studying. I wonder how many remember what our subject was last night. A rebellious generation. Now, every night there's going to be a connection from what we studied the previous night. You don't want to miss a night because each night we're building a case. We found that the world is in trouble. We found that the nations don't know how to solve the problems of humanity. And God is waiting for the Christians who have the privilege of understanding the solution to the problems of humanity to step forward and do something in this last hour. And so we found that the great crisis right now is that there's a rebellious generation. The world can't stop that. But we're going to see that God has given you and I something that can stop that tonight. In fact, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Psalms, the 78th division. Psalms 78. And I want you to see, I didn't get a chance to touch the greatest heart of the rebellious generation last night. 
But tonight, I want to identify what the greatest part of this rebellious generation is because you and I can do something about it. The only way to solve a problem is to know something of what the problem is. Does that make sense? You cannot bring a solution to the problem unless you know the cause. And we're going to put our hand directly on the cause of what this rebellious generation is tonight. And then we're going to do as our custom is. We're going to stop and have a three-minute word of prayer. Amen? Amen? We want not only a week of meetings, but we want a week of prayer. prayer. No revival without prayer. And I'm going to say this. If I were to come to your house, do I have the privilege of just painting it the color I like? Would you like me to come to your house and paint it the way you want? Or should I respect you if I come to your house? I should respect you. And I'm going to ask that you respect when we come to the house together. If you, if you have come and you have been passing out materials that has not been uh, surveyed by me, that I have not looked at and you're just passing out materials in a meeting like this without making sure that those materials are in harmony with the Bible, I'm going to ask that you be respectful and look at me first. Amen? Amen. Now listen to me. If you, if you want to, to have your own meeting, then you can do that and pass out as many materials you want. But if you have not done that, I'm going to ask, I was informed that there were some passion out of materials that uh, were not made aware. So I'm just going to ask, if you do that, please see me first. Amen. Let's respect God and the man of God. Is that all right? Amen. Now, the Bible says in Psalm 78, beginning in verses 1, Lord, bless these words in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 1 says, give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth how? In a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and have known of our, what's that next word? Fathers have told us. Now, you're going to see very significantly that the idea of the man, of the husband, or the father is very significant in the Bible. In fact, the Bible goes on, speaking of the fathers, it says in verse 4, we will not what? Hide them from their children. Who is not to hide this from their children? The fathers. The Bible says we will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength. Who is to show to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength? Who is to show that? The fathers. It says the generation and his strength and his wonderful works that he have done. Verse 5 says, for he have established a testimony where? And Jacob, now, does anybody know this young man right here? Does anybody know this young man? Can someone help him with a Bible? Let's get this man a Bible. We want all of us to have Bibles. Amen? Amen? It's so good to have Bibles. Thank you, Elder. If we just get this young man a Bible, we want to make sure we can see that. Because I believe that young men with Bibles, they can do something. What do you say? Amen. The Bible goes on to say in verse 5, For he have established, Psalm 78, verse 5, For he have established a testimony in Jacob, and appointed a what? It was a law in Israel. What was the law in Israel? Notice what it says. A law in Israel which he commanded our, not our mothers, not our children, but commanded our what? Our fathers that they should make them known to their children. The Bible shows the importance of the father. Now let's watch what happens when a father is taken out of the home. Let's keep reading. The Bible says in verse 6 that the generation to come might know them, even the children which what? should be born, Psalm 78, 5, should be born, who should arise and declare them to what? Do you notice a vicious cycle? That if a father can be taken out, he can't make it known to his children. And that child grows up, and as a father, he can't make it known to his, his children. That child grows up, and so we have a vicious cycle. Now notice what happens, verse 7. That they might set their hope in God, and not forget the works of God, but keep his what? Now, if this doesn't happen, the Bible tells us what happens. Verse 8 all together. And might not be what? As their fathers a stubborn and rebellious generation. A generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was what? Not steadfast with God. And that tells us that the only way that the devil can get a rebellious generation is by taking away fathers. And so if we see today a rebellious generation, that means that something has happened to father. Something has happened to husband. Something has happened to the man. And so the week of prayer that we've entitled is, 
in search for a man. And let me tell you something. Just because you're not a woman doesn't mean you're a man. Just because you're not a woman doesn't mean you're a man. God is looking for a man. You will find out there wouldn't be so many thugs on the street if there were real men. There wouldn't be so many people in prison if there were real men. There wouldn't be so much problems in society if there were real men. The problem is God can't find a man. And the greatest one in the world today is the one of a man. And so God is in search for a man. Somebody says, I don't know what that week of prayer is about. I hope you do now. God's looking for some men. Not just a few good men. <laughs> the government's looking for that. God is looking for a lot of men. And so before we get into our message tonight, in search for a man, I want to do as our custom is. We're going to reverently pray and stop and say, Lord, don't just help us to be in the house. Make us men. And the only way for a grown man to become a man, that means as a young man, he must learn. Is that right? Amen. And so, young brothers, I want you to listen tonight. And you older brothers. And even the woman. Because women help make men. Did you know that? Yes. And so every one of us has a part to play in the making of a man. And let me tell you something. If a man is not made, the world is in trouble. And so we're going to stop now and we're going to take three minutes and we're going to plead and pray. Lord, open up my heart to the Spirit. Help that nothing will stop me from being at these meetings every week because every night we're going to be building higher and higher. And the devil says if he can keep you from coming to one meeting, he can stop you from coming to the next. My friends, don't let rain do that. Amen? And so if we can reverently kneel together and approach the Lord in prayer. And we want to spend three minutes pleading that God would open up our hearts and minds, pleading that the Holy Spirit would speak to us and for the outpouring of his Spirit, and after a few moments of private prayer, we'll get into the message in search for a man. If we can reverently, reverently pray.
our Father and our God, our Savior and our friend. We're so thankful, Lord, that while there were many that did not wake up this morning, that you graced us with life and an opportunity of salvation. Lord, who are we that you love us so much to bring a whole week of prayer? Lord, angels wonder why it is that we pray so little. It's amazing, Lord, that after a minute, sometimes we begin to fidget, we get fidgety. We run out of words to say to you, Lord, and it's just indication of the fact that we don't know you. Father, we don't, we don't know what it's like to be in your presence. Father, we get bored in five minutes and ten minutes. How can we think that we can spend an eternity with you? Teach us how to pray, Lord. Teach us how to talk to you as a friend. Develop our homes, Lord. Lord, you are searching for a man and for men. I pray that you would do something special in this week of prayer and that you would do something tonight. Remove every distraction. Allow drooping heads and eyes that, that, that have tired themselves out of the things of the world to be invigorated by the Spirit of heaven. I pray, Lord, that you would hush talking mouths, that you would allow everything to be centered on Jesus. Father, I pray that you would speak to me and allow me to speak to your people. I pray, Lord, that you would open up our eyes and help us to understand what it means that you are in search for a man. And may we say like Isaiah, here am I, Lord. Send me. Now, and abide with us, we pray, and we pray for the presence of your Holy Spirit that we may feel angels walking up and down in this assembly, that truly we might be in heavenly places. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder, we are climbing Jacob's ladder, soldiers of the cross, every round, every round goes higher. Father, we're thankful that Jesus is Jacob's ladder. And so we ask that you would take us higher than we've ever been tonight. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you will take your Bibles and turn to the book of Daniel, to the book of Daniel chapter 12, to the book of Daniel chapter 12, and when you get there, if you will let me know by saying amen. Now you brought your Bibles, Amen. I'm going to remind you tonight, if you brought those Bibles, raise them up so I can see those Bibles. I like to see Bibles. In fact, if you don't have a Bible, we want to make sure that we're always looking on with someone who does. We want to see Bibles. And one of the clearest things that we understand that, 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 uh, of what is going to bring about a man is the words of God. You can't have a man that doesn't read the word of God. You see, the word of God makes men. You see, television makes boys. The word of God makes men. The Bible says that when we eat the word of God, we grow up into the full stature of the man in Christ Jesus. And when you study the Bible, we find that, that the great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward for nearly 6,000 years tonight is about to end. That in these last days that we are on the verge of a stupendous crisis, a crisis that the world does not understand. The world sees the problems. They see the fire and the flood. They see the hurricanes and tornadoes and cyclones and earthquakes. They see the upheaval and the environmental devastation, but they don't understand what that means. They see that over in Haiti that, that most of the major buildings were knocked down. They see the cyclones. They even saw that sinkhole where it was bigger than the, the size of two apartments right in the ground. And man is wondering what this means. 
Man will look at these environmental devastations and he sees it and, and he wonders and, and even the airplanes call it an act of God. We don't understand what this means. We see the war and the rumors of war. We see Afghanistan and the, the hundreds and thousands of lives being sacrificed. We see North Korea that has just bombed South Korea. And man looks at this and says, what does it mean? My friends, do you know that only Daniel can understand this? You see in Daniel's day that, that there was a time when there was a king of Babylon by the name of Belshazzar. And there came a great crisis in Belshazzar's cabinet. It was the United Nations. The whole world had come together. Babylon was the greatest nation of that time. And when you look at Babylon, it came to the place that there in Babylon, they were having a party. They forgot about God. They were blaspheming the name of God. It's almost like how it is on television. The only time that a, a sitcom mentions the name of God is when they take his name in vain. And even that seems like they're talking about him too much. My friends, when we look at how it was in Babylon, they were partying and pleasuring, giving no attention to the God of heaven. And all of a sudden, there came something that brought that party to a quick end. There came a bloodless hand. You know the story. Read it in Daniel 5 when you get home. I tell you, the Bible's interesting. There came a bloodless hand that came into the party room, and the club, club stopped. Music stopped, and there on that plaster was written the words, many, many Tackle you far and sin. And they saw the hand, but they didn't understand. They said, what does it mean? And, and through, the, through, through the, the, the system or the understanding of the aged, this old woman that used to know who Daniel was, he was a part of Nebuchadnezzar's court, said, you need to bring in Daniel. And Daniel was brought into that room, and they didn't understand. They said, Daniel, what does it mean? And Daniel looked at the writing and he said, many, many, take your forest in. It means that Babylon is weighed in the balances and is found wanting. That the kingdom has been numbered. And it said tonight that, that, that it is finished and come to an end. And he says it is going to be divided and given up. And the king heard it and his knees began to knock. My friends, it would almost be like a minister coming to America just like Babylon. You know, Babylon was the greatest, most powerful nation of that time. It was the wonders of the world that in Babylon they had those hanging gardens. They had the aqueducts that it was a wonder of the world. And Babylon was the greatest nation, the wealthiest nation, the most powerful nation. No military like Babylon on the face of the earth. And Daniel said, Babylon is getting ready to come to an end. But like a minister saying that America is getting ready to go through a crisis. An impending crisis. Do you know that we are getting ready to go through a crisis? Do you know that this same book of Daniel tells us that a time of trouble is coming such as that the world has never seen and the world knows nothing about it. My friend, America has been found wanting. Its numbers are weighed in the balances and the nation has almost reached the limit where God will no longer protect this wicked country. My friends, we are getting ready to see a judgment like never was and ministers are afraid to talk about it. Political leaders are afraid to talk about it. They're crying peace and safety. My friends, a storm is coming. And the Bible says in Daniel 12 that the world didn't understand this. And God expected seven-day Adventists to open up our mouths. You know how many Christians in other churches that don't know this but love the Lord? And you are being quiet when God has put in your hands the secret to the problems of this world. My friends, the Bible says in Daniel 12 beginning in verse 9. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In verses 9, notice what it says. You see, Daniel's a special book. We're told we should study it more and more as we near the end of time. Verse 9, it says, and he said, go thy way, Daniel. For the words are what? Closed up and sealed. How long? Till the time of the end. In other words, Daniel could not be understood until the time of the... That means that Daniel is an end time book. In the last days that Daniel, if we can cut it down just a little... That in the last days that Daniel should be understood. The Bible says that go thy way, close it up till the time of the end. But notice verse 10 together. The Bible says, many shall be what? Purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly and some of the wicked. Now that's not what the Bible says. I want to make sure you're reading your Bibles. I want to wonder what version you have in your Bible. You know, every version can't be trusted. You know that, don't you? But the Bible says in that none of the wicked shall what? You see, the world doesn't understand. The wicked world does not understand. They see all of the problems, but they don't understand. 
God intended that you and I would not only understand the problem but the solution. It says, while the world does not understand, here comes the word but. The Bible says, but the but the what? The wise, the wise shall what? Uh, shall understand. God expects you and I to understand this. But let me tell you something. The reason why the majority of the world does not understand what's taking place in these last days is because they don't understand what happened at the beginning of time. You ever heard two people having a conversation? You come in at the end of the story, and they're talking. You don't know what they're talking about, but you heard something that you just had to put your two cents in it, and your two cents wasn't even worth a penny, but you had to put it in anyway. You just put it in, and you know what they say to you. you maybe you said it or you heard it said, you button into the conversation. You need to get out of it. And the problem is you came in at the end of the conversation. And the only way to understand the end of time, the only way to understand the end of the great controversy or that wonderful story of redemption is by first understanding the, the beginning. And I find that not only the world, but many in the church don't really understand the beginning of the great controversy. And this is why we don't understand today. In fact, notice what the Bible says in 1 John. What did I say? Near the book of Revelation, just before Jude, and you go through the Johns. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, go to the book of 1st John. In the book of 1st John chapter 4, I want you to read the beginning of the story. Jesus said, I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and the, and only to understand the end, you must first understand the beginning. And someone says, well, why are we going to 1st John to understand the beginning? I thought Genesis was the beginning. Yes, Genesis is the book of the beginning, but, but my friends, you know there's more than one beginning. Genesis is the beginning of the history of this world. But before this world was, was created, there was something that happened before that. Is that right? Somebody says, I don't know that. Well, let me tell you. In Genesis 1, 2, and 3, you read of a serpent. Am I right or wrong? Who deceived Eve in the garden? A serpent. Who was the serpent? The serpent was a medium for the devil. Well, who was the devil? The devil, before he became the devil, his name was Lucifer. We studied that last night. So if the devil is already the devil in the book of Genesis, that means that the great controversy started before the book of Genesis. And so, my friends, I want to introduce you to the beginning. In 1 John chapter 4, this is one of those places where we peek in to the beginning of the great story. And the only way to understand the end is by understanding the beginning. Let's read the beginning in 1 John 4. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Beginning in verse 16. Let's read that together. 1 John 4, beginning in verse 16. You're there, amen? The Bible says all together, it says, And we have what? Known and believed the love that God have to us. God is love. Would you repeat that with me? God is love. One more time. God is love. Do you believe that? That's the beginning of the story. Someone says, what do you mean? We don't understand it. But listen now. It says, God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God where? In him. My friends, God is love. This is the beginning. This is why we were created. This is why the whole universe was brought into existence. God is love. His nature, his character, his law, his government. It always has been. It ever will be. Every manifestation of creative power is an expression of the infinite matchless love of the heart of God. You know that every time we see the beautiful sunrise and sunset, that every time we hear the sweet singing of the birds, that every time we smell that sweet fragrance of flower and tree and shrub, we are to see in it the smile and the love of Jesus. I say every manifestation of creative power is an expression of the infinite, deep, timeless, matchless love that is in the heart of Jesus. And my brothers and my sisters, God said that he was love, and yet Satan challenged this. You see, this is what led to the war in heaven. This is what led to the spirit of rebellion. Satan, that great liar, said that God is not love. He said God's laws cannot be kept. He said God is unjust. God is unfair. God's rules and regulations are keeping us from that which is good. And many of us believe the lie today. The devil had the first radio broadcast and told man that Christianity is restrictive. He said, you can't do this. And if you did it, he said, the only reason why God doesn't want you to do this and do that is because he doesn't want you to become like him. My brothers and sisters, any command that God has given us is for our good. If he tells us not to do it, it's because he wants to save us. It's not that he wants to keep us back as youth and adults from having a good time. He's trying to keep us back from the lung cancer, from smoking. He's trying to keep us back from the AIDS by adultery and fornication. 
He's trying to keep us back from the sisters having men that won't stay with them, unwed pregnancies. He's trying to keep us back from all of the hell that's on this earth. My brothers and my sisters, we think that God is trying to keep something good back from us, but no good thing will he withhold to him that walk uprightly. God is love, and the devil has challenged the love of God. But the devil's a liar. And my brothers and my sisters, God is just, and before the great controversy comes to an end, God is going to get a group, a generation on this earth, that are going to be so convinced by that love that they will be willing rather to die than to break the love of God. They'll be willing to die rather than sin. They're going to give a full and final display of the love of God. And this is going to close the great story of redemption. This is going to close the great, the great controversy. And, but how can you show or tell the world that love if you don't know what that love is? My friends, we have to spend time developing this love. We have to spend time understanding this love. And I found that most of us today don't understand it, that there's a practical application that has caused many of us not to understand the love of God. We think that we were brought into existence by what has been called the theory of evolution. That, is de that, that, that denies the very existence. You can't have a God of love if we've been involved. Evolution does not teach a God of love, and this is being taught in our public schools right here in this, in this city. This is being taught in all of the public systems, and we're wondering today, how in the world are our children acting like animals? Well, listen, if you were born from an animal, created by an animal, evolved from an animal, why won't you act like an animal? You see, the very reason why we have so much problems today is because we think that our ancestry takes us back to an animal. So we call each other dog. You see, we don't understand where this idea came from. It's a part of the evolution process that reduces men instead of acting like men to act like dogs. You know what a dog does? He can make some babies. Now listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. My brothers and my sisters, this is the process of evolution, and it's not science, it's a theory. It hasn't been proven, it hasn't been observed, it hasn't been demonstrated, it hasn't been fact. It is a theory called evolution, and it doesn't make sense. In fact, evolution is not based on science, evolution is based on foolishness. i never forget reading and passing of one atheist who was complaining to a Christian of how the government was favoring the Christians. The atheist was complaining, saying to the Christian, why is it that the government always gives Christian holidays? Gives him Christmas and Easter and all the rest. And he began to go on all the different holidays that the Christian has. And then all of a sudden the atheist said, but, but, but there's no holiday for, for us. And the Christian looked at him and said, what do you mean? You got a holiday? He said, we don't know about any holiday. What holiday? He said, April 1st. He said, what is that? That's April Fool's Day. And that Christian said, because the fool has said in his heart that there is no God, you already have a holiday. My brothers and my sisters, it's based on foolishness, this idea of evolution. But now listen to me. As we look at this, I don't care what man or what school a man went to, how many schools he's been in. I don't care how long he's been to school. I don't care how many letters behind his name. I'm not going to let a man make a monkey out of me. My friends, you and I were created in the image of God. And if we understand that, instead of acting like animals, we'll act like Jesus. My brothers and sisters, while many of us say, oh, we don't believe in evolution. There are many Christians never be deceived by evolution, but, but there's a, another part of the deception, and that is most Christians have been deceived into believing that we were brought into existence because of loneliness. You ever heard that before? In fact, one poet, I remember reading in passing, I heard it said, I, I think his name was James Weldon Johnson. He said that, that God stepped out in space. and He thought to himself, I'm lonely, so I'll make me a world. Oh, it sounds poetic. But everything that's poetic is not true. You ask some girls that now uh, don't know any better. Everything that is poetic, my friends, is not true. And my friends, he said that, that he was lonely. I'll make me a man. And many Christians and scholars believe that the reason why we were created was because of loneliness. You think that's why God created us? My brothers and my sisters, listen to me. You ever seen the, a child that was brought into the world because of loneliness? You ever seen a child that was brought into existence by an invention of boredom? I tell you, it's a sad thing you ever see it. I've seen a child where, where you see it where husband and wife, father and mother, they didn't love each other anymore. Their marriage was getting ready to break up. They didn't have a life. They were bored with each other. And they said, we better do something to spark a, 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 some life into our relationship. They said, let's have a child and maybe that will keep us together. Let me tell you something. Having children won't keep your home together. In fact, it will just magnify the problems you already had unless you have a good home. And so, my friends, you see a child that's bored, it would only take a few months before that, board is as bo that child is as bored as his parents were. 
And my friends, if God brought us to existence because of loneliness, you think that in eternity and the future, we won't get lonely together? My friends, I would hate to be in the invention of boredom. We weren't brought into the world because we're lonely. What text is that in the Bible? That's not in the Bible. In fact, do you know that God gave husband and wife, father and mother in this earth, the ability to know what really led to creation? You know, when, when husband and wife come together in the physical act called making love, you know what one of the technical terms for that is? Procreation. And so the very thing that led to procreation, God intended to be an object lesson of what led to really creation. Now, my brothers and sisters, in God's plan, when a husband and wife love each other, love making is a physical expression of the love between husband and wife. They aren't bored with each other. They're really in love. And in that fellowship of love, in that physical union, a child is born as the fruit of the fellowship of love. And in that procreation, God intended we would understand what happened in heaven, even though we weren't there. You see, in eternity past, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost were not lonely. But like a husband and a wife, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost were enjoying life and love and fellowship together. And their unselfish heart says, we're enjoying life. Let's make another order of intelligent beings that can enjoy what we're enjoying. You ever been somewhere where you tasted something you like? I tell you something, you ever taste something you like? You said, I wish my wife was here to taste that. You save a piece somewhere in a little napkin and you save it and say, honey, taste this. My friends, God, the great Godhead, experienced the fellowship and he turns, he passed, and they said, we must make man. And so you know what happened? The Holy Spirit looking at the Father. The Father looking at the Son. And they said, let us make man in our own image, in our own likeness. So that they can look and feel the joy and the satisfaction of eternal life. We were not brought into existence by evolution. It was not the invention of boredom or loneliness. It wasn't even lust. Lust is selfish. You know why we were brought into existence? Love. The Bible says in 1 John 4, let's read it together. Beginning in verse 8, you're there, amen? The Bible says in verse 8, he that what? Loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is what? God is love. Look at verse 7. Look at the Bible. Tell us why we were brought into existence. Verse 7 says, Beloved, let us what? Love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is what? Born of God. Brought into existence and know of God. It was not lust. It was not loneliness. It was not boredom. It was love that brought you and I into existence today. And do you know that if we really understood this, we would find our greatest joy in fellowship with Jesus. In fact, notice what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians. What did I say? In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I want you to see this. In 1 Corinthians 1, you and I were created for a fellowship. We were created for a relationship. We were created for a oneness with Jesus. And unless we understand this, we don't understand where the real joy is in life. Real joy, lasting satisfaction, everlasting happiness comes in a relationship with Jesus. And let me tell you something. The devil knows this. And so you know what he does? He tries to prevent you from getting to know Jesus. You know what the devil says? The devil says, make some internets. I can stop some people from talking to God. The devil said, make some cell phones. I can get some people to stop talking to God. Today, we have many people that will scroll through their cell phones more than they scroll through their Bibles. Talk on cell phones for hours and never once really spend time with God in prayer. My friends, we're missing out on something very sweet. And the devil knows that Jesus is attractive. You know that? Did you know that Jesus is attractive? He's the one altogether lovely. You know, when I look at my wife, I know what attraction is. Boy, I tell you, my wife is attractive. You know what attraction means? It means it draws you. I look at my wife sometimes, it draws to her. Attracted. And Jesus is attracted. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And so the devil's plan is to cover the face of Jesus. Because if he can get you to stop looking at Jesus, he knows that, that he can prevent you from reaching salvation and true joy. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Beginning in verses 9, notice what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9, the Bible says, God is what? Faithful. Now, even when we're not faithful, God is faithful. When we are not faithful to God in the morning, God's faithful to us. We sometimes don't even think about God two hours a day. Can you imagine what would happen if God were to forget about us? For just a minute, our hearts would stop beating. The world would stop going in its orbit. My friends, this universe cannot function if God forgot about us, but I'm thankful that our God does not sleep nor slumber. 
The Bible says God is faithful by whom you were what? Called. What were you called for? Were you called to destruction? Were you called to death? You were called to what? Unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And even when we messed up, Jesus went to the cross that every one of us could regain that redemption, that fellowship. I say, thank I'm thankful to Jesus. What about you? Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that we were made to find real joy in that fellowship? In fact, go to the book of Colossians. What did I say? I want you to see something very interesting. It's almost so good that if you didn't see it from your own Bible, you might not believe me. Go to Colossians. I want you to see this yourself. Colossians, the second chapter, you see God made us this way. In fact, right now, I'll never forget, a man told me, he said, I couldn't believe what his wife did, and I'm sorry it happened this way. But he said he, 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 would, he had got a rental car and was taking it somewhere, and he got into the rental car, and he told his wife as they were getting home, make sure you fill the, uh, the car back up with gasoline. And he went home, and all of a sudden, the, the, the wife came, and she went to the pump, but she didn't put unleaded in. And that car was an unleaded tank. You know what she put in? Well, she put in some lead, and you know what happened to that car, don't you? It messed it up. Now, what would happen if we put water into a car? Would that make it go? Why not? It was not designed to run on water. You and I were not designed to find peace and happiness without Jesus. And so man today is saying, why is it that, that I can get all the money in the world and still I'm not satisfied? Why is it that, that I have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, a husband and a wife, and still I'm empty? Why is it that every time I go to the alcohol bottle, I'm still not filled? Why is it that nothing that I get can solve my problems? The problem is you were designed to find satisfaction in Jesus. The Bible says in Colossians 2, notice what it says, beginning in verse 6. You're there, amen? In verse 6, the Bible says, as ye have therefore what? Receive, what's that name? I like to hear it. Christ Jesus. You like to hear it? You know that we're told that, that, that when the angels hear that, they stop and listen to what we say. I read where a modern prophet wrote, a prophet wrote, that whenever the name of Jesus is spoken, that the angels stop and get close to say, what did they say? So when I say Jesus, the angels stop. And I say Jesus. They say stop. They want to know what we're going to say. The name of Jesus is so sweet that even the birds are there singing. The Bible says, as you therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so do what? Walk ye in him. Who's the him? Jesus. Verse 9, verse 10. Verse 10 says, and ye are what? Complete in him. Who's the him? You're complete in Jesus Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. So we are complete in him. We are complete in Jesus. I want to ask a question to overstate the simple. If we are complete in Jesus, then if we don't have Jesus, what are we? We're incomplete. And to be incomplete simply means that we're missing something. So without Jesus, we feel we're missing something. And many are trying to fill that void with a television. Do you know that some people can't even go to sleep without cutting the television on? They have to have that noise in the background. Some people cannot find satisfaction unless they're with this person or that person or this thing or that thing. My friends, materials will never feel the emptiness of our hearts. I don't care how many gifts you get, how many cars you get, how many houses you have, how many suits you get. That, that the only emptiness, whether man or woman, boy or girl, can only be filled and satisfied in Jesus Christ. And this is what the Bible teaches. My friends, do you know that this is why there's so much fornication and adultery in the world today? Man thinks, you know, he, he, he doesn't have an empty, he doesn't have his void filled, he doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. And so he says, I think I'm missing something. And so he says, I need a husband or a wife. So they get boyfriend or girlfriend, husband and wife, and then they get married, and then that emptiness is not gone. And so they say, well, maybe I got the wrong one. And so they look for another one to fill that void. And they find another one, didn't they? They're still empty. They, they, they've committed fornication, still empty. They go to another and another. But the emptiness, I don't care who it is, can never be filled unless we first have Jesus. This is what the alcoholic needs to hear. This is what the drug addict needs to hear. This is what the pimp and the prostitute need to hear. If we really understood what Jesus was and who he was, when we introduced him, it would solve the ills of human life. But the problem is that even in the church, we don't know Jesus. The problem is we cannot talk about someone that we do not know. And do you know it takes time to get to know Jesus? Can you imagine a husband and wife? That the only time they talk was then when they woke up in the morning, you kiss your wife in the morning, and then all throughout the day you never talk to her again. And then you get home in the evening and you say goodnight, wife, and you go to sleep, and that happened every day, every week, every month. How long would that marriage last? It wouldn't last too long. 
And yet we do that to Jesus. We, we may say a prayer in the morning, Oh, Father, thank you for waking me up. And rush off to school or to work or to play. Go all through a day. Maybe mention a prayer at noon. Maybe, I say. Then you get home and you've been so busy, you get in and cut on the news. You want to see what happened on CNN. You want to see Kobe Bryant score 40 points. You want to watch all the latest things and the news. And at the end of the day, you're so tired and bogged down that if you do pray and say, now nah, I lay me down to sleep, sometimes you fall asleep on your knees. And then scramble into the bed and wake up the next morning just to do the same thing over again. You think we're going to get to know Jesus like that? You think that a crisis is getting ready to take place? I'm going to show you this week. That a crisis is getting ready to break in America in the next few months and to the next few years, and we're not ready? And God is saying only a deep relationship with Jesus can prepare us. And so the devil says, take away their time. Make them bored with the Bible. Make them bored with Christianity. And the devil has set in foot to create an entertainment generation. And he's done it. Well, we want to come to church to be entertained. We can go to some concert, but we don't want to pray. We can go to some amusement park, but we don't want to study. We can go down and play at a park or do this thing or that, but we don't want to witness and tell the world of what is going to make men and women ready to spend eternity with Jesus. And my friends, something must change. There must come a revival and a reformation, and I believe it's beginning tonight. What do you say? And the only reason you're here tonight is because I believe that God's saying he wants to start with you. He wants to start with me. And my brothers and my sisters, we are complete in him. And do you know that this sweet fellowship was so sweet when God first created this world? Do you know that before that, that sin into the world, that God and man used to talk face to face? Go to the book of Isaiah. What did I say? To the book of Isaiah chapter 59. Notice what the Bible says in Isaiah 59. It was so sweet that man would talk to God face to face. And you know, I, you know sometimes it's wonderful when you have a wonderful wife or a wonderful husband. You love to wake up in the morning to their face. You love to, to, to wake up in the morning to be able to fellowship. Do you know that's how it was when, 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 when you woke up in the morning, when man woke up in the morning, Jesus already had breakfast ready. Jesus had breakfast ready. It was already hanging on the true tree. Fruit was there. We talked about that mango yesterday. That mango that would drip down your face. Let me tell you something, friends. It was so beautiful that Adam could have walked up to the mango tree, and if it was even still taller than him, that Adam could have said to the mango tree, give me one of your fruits. And the mango tree would have bowed its limbs and dropped into the hands of Adam. That was what it was like. Somebody said, I don't believe you. The Bible says that, God was that man was made in the image of God. Do you know that when God speaks, what happens? Nature listens. And when, when man was in the same position of God and the dominion of God, animate and inanimate nature responded to God. They could hold converse with the leaf and the plant, gathering from each the secrets of his life. Man had power over animal and beast and dominion. Even the trees would listen to man before sin. Can you imagine they going down to that coconut tree and say, give me one of your coconuts? My friends, that's how it was. Everything was perfect. There wasn't no boring school, no mortgage that was not paid. Everything was taken care of. Everything was wonderful. And then something messed it up. Three letters. You know what it was? Sin. That's the enemy. Today we think that sin is the friend. Sin is the enemy. The Bible says in Isaiah 59, beginning in verses 1, the Bible says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot say, Praise God. Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. Verse 2 says, but your iniquities have what? Separated between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Man before sin enjoyed face to face communion with his maker. Oh my friends, it was sweet, but that three letter word sin messed it all up. And when sin entered the world, it changed the condition of the world. In fact, go to the book of Genesis. I want you to see this. In Genesis chapter 3, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Everything was perfect, but when sin entered the world, sin messed it up. Do you know that before sin, God would even visit with man every day? Every day, God would visit with man, and they would have a daily date. In the cool of the evening, God and man would meet together. In fact, Genesis 3 says it this way. The Bible says in Genesis 3, when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. They would meet together in the cool of the day, morning and evening, God would visit with man. And can you imagine what it was like God sometimes would leave hit, little hidden love messages in nature? 
You know, leave something behind a tree. You know, sometimes I would, when I proposed to my wife, I left little messages, little hidden messages all around the room telling her to go to different places, showing her that I was getting ready to tell her something beautiful, getting ready to ask her for something like Jesus did. He would hide little messages around the room. And at the end of the day, Jesus would come back and talk with them in the evening of the day. Did you find the message? They would say, oh, yes, I saw that flower you left for me. Do you see the message? Oh, I saw that tree that you told them. They would understand in nature that God was love and it was a wonderful experience and then something happened. It was almost, my friends, like a man and a woman who were deeply in love with each other. And they would have it where every day they would, call, they would do what was called family time. You ever heard of family time? You think that's needed today? Oh, we need some family time. And they would have family time and every day after the man would come back home from work, he would say, nothing else matters but you, my wife. He would cut off the cell phone, cut off the, the computer, cut off the television, and the only thing that was left was for him and his wife to have a wonderful date dinner, cannon lit, spend time talking with each other, fellowship with each other, and they would do this for years, enjoying each other. Then one day, the husband came home, and he looks around the house, and he doesn't smell any food cooking when he gets home. He looks at the table, but there's no candle lit dinner this day. He looks into the kitchen. He says, oh, maybe my wife is surprising me. Maybe she's done something in the back. And so he, he goes through the living room into the back room of the house, into the bedroom. No sign of his wife. He looks into the, to the closet and there's nothing left, not even a sock. She's gone. And all of a sudden, the man says, where are you? That's how it was when Jesus first came, when man, Adam and Eve sinned, God was looking for that daily date, and he gets back, and man has ran and hid himself. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis 3. Man has sinned, and the Bible says in verse 8, and they heard what? The voice, Genesis 3, verse 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God doing what? Walking in the garden when in the cool of the day. This was the appointment. This was the date. And Adam and Eve, they didn't run to Jesus like they did years before. You know what they did? They hid themselves. Can you imagine what you would feel like if your wife started hiding from you? They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And verse 9 says, And the Lord called unto him and Adam and said unto him, Where are you, Adam? Where is the man? Where are you, Adam? And my brothers and sisters, can you imagine what God was saying? God was not asking for Adam's location. Man today have created what is called a GPS. Global positioning satellites, they can come to the point where no matter where you go, they can find a nose hair in your nose. You get into some of these cars, they can find where you are. God was not asking for the location of Adam. The God who made heaven and earth and sea knew where Adam was. He was asking, where are you in your relationship with me? Who has separated you from me? Why are you hiding from me? Where are you, my friends? And Adam, God was looking for, you know, we think we've invented something when we make something, don't we? We think we invented something. You know, God made cell phones long before we made it. God made cell phones. You say, what do I mean? In the body. Do you know that the cells communicate with the other cells through electric dendrites? That when God created man, there was already cellular communication. And we think we made something. God was not looking for man's location. My friends, God has been on search for a man for over 6,000 years. God has been looking for Adam. Now notice he didn't say, Eve, where are you? Did he love Eve? Yes, he did. Did he love, did he love everybody else? Yes, he did. Why did he say Adam? I'm going to tell you something. Men, if you're in this room tonight, listen to me. If your family is lost, before God goes to the children that are not paying attention, before God goes to the wife that, 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 that may have turned her back on God, God's going to first come to the man. He's going to come to Adam. He's going to say, where are the children? And many men that thought that they preached or taught or taught, many men are going to believe that they're going to enter heaven. And God is going to stop them at the gate and say, wait a minute, where's your wife and children? Where's the flock that I've given you? And many men at that time are going to be speechless. My brothers and sisters, ever since that time, God has positioned the man as the head of the house. And so that God came to the head and said, Adam, where are you? And from the beginning of time, God has been in search for a man. My brothers and my sisters, the Bible says, 
In verses 10, he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. Do you see the condition of man's heart? That instead of love, now we have rebellion. That instead of, of unselfishness, we have selfishness. Man no longer enjoying the presence of Jesus. And this is the condition of our hearts today. And God is doing everything he can to bring us back into a relationship with himself where we can find joy, not in running from God, but we can find joy in running where? To God. Do you know at the end of time, some men would have never learned this lesson? Go to Revelation. What did I say? We'll see it from Genesis to Revelation. Look at it. Revelation chapter 6. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation 6. God is in search for man. The Bible says in Revelation 6, and the sad reality is that in every generation, God has never been able to find a lot of men. In Revelation 6, beginning in verse 14. Notice what the Bible says in Revelation 6, beginning in verse 14. The Bible says concerning that sixth seal, the Bible says, and the heavens did what? departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth and the what and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men it seemed like every man and every bond man and every free man what did he do he hid himself just like adam god in the very beginning came to man and man hides himself God at the very end of time at the second coming of Jesus is in search for a man again and he gets there and man, the majority of men, where are they doing? The Bible says, hear themselves in the rocks and in the mountains and said to the mountain and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Why? For the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? My brothers and sisters, we see it from the beginning to the end of time. God has been looking for man, and for the most part, men have been running from their sacred responsibility. My friends, let me tell you something. Satan has studied the structure of a Christian home. And Satan has found out that only a Christian home can defeat his plan. That only a Christian home can defeat the plan of the devil. And so the devil says, how can I destroy the Christian home? But when the Christian home is right, it's impregnable. The devil looks at it as an incomprehensible mystery. But he's found that the strength of the home is also the weakness of the home. Look at what it says in Psalms 11. Oh, I know you're ready to go home. In Psalms 11, notice what the Bible says in Psalms 11. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. I want you to see something. I want you to see that God has revealed the structure of the home and Satan has studied this and he's found that if he wants to successfully destroy the structure of a house is just like a building. If I want to destroy a building, do I attack the window? Do I go for the walls? What do I attack? I attack the foundation. The Bible says in Psalms 11. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In Psalms 11 verse 3, let's read it together. In Psalms 11 3, the Bible says, if the what? If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? So the devil says, all I need to do is attack the foundation. And if he can destroy the foundation of the Christian home, he can destroy the Christian home. Now, I wonder what the foundation of the Christian home is. As Satan has studied the foundation of the Christian home, he's found that children are not the foundation. What do you put down first? The walls or the foundation? The roof or the foundation? So the foundation is the primary structure of a building the first thing that goes down and my friends the first thing that God made in either creation or redemption was not children it wasn't even a woman you know what the foundation relationship was the primary thing that God made the man was first formed and then the woman God made man out of the dust of the ground and my friends there never could have could have been a woman without first having a man because the Bible says that God took the rib from Adam's side and from it he made a woman. And he said he should call her woman because she was taken where? Out of man. So to destroy a woman, just destroy the man. And any generation where you want to destroy a woman from being a princess, just destroy the man. And when you take the man out of the picture, a woman becomes a little more than a prostitute. My brothers and my sisters, this is what the devil has done. He said, if I can destroy a father from the home, then a woman doesn't know how to be a woman. 
If I can destroy father from the home, father, woman will accept every affection. This is why, my friends, with my daughter, I shower her with as much affection, kissing her, hugging her, until she says, Daddy, stop! You know why? I know something. I know that if I shower her and fill her with the affection and the love of a man, she doesn't want some other young brother with his pants hanging down coming to her. I wish a brother would come like that. Now, I'll teach him what a man is. Amen. <laughs> Amen. My brothers and sisters, as we understand what has happened, it is because of a lack of an affection of a man toward his daughter that makes her crave affection. This is why a girl wants a boyfriend. She's hungry. And listen to me. If you take a man and starve a man for a few days, he will go to a garbage can. And do you know that many today, many young sisters are going to garbage cans to find husbands? Listen to me. If we can feed our young girls with what a man is, what he looks like, what his privilege is and responsibility is, they would look at these young boys today and say, you need to grow up. You see, the problem, we don't need to blame it on the pimp or the gangster. The problem, we don't need to blame it on the drug addict. The problem, we don't need to blame it on the world. The problem is with the Christian man. God is in search for a man. And you know, my friends, if Satan can take a young boy and make him never see what a father is, he'll never know what it means to be a man. Our young boys today think that Snoop, Snoop Dogg is a man. Our young boys today think that Jay-Z is a man. Our young boys today think 50 Cent is a man. That's not a man. He's a male, but he's not a man. And my brother says, I say it respectfully. I don't mean to question these men, but these men have never seen true Christianity. The problem is, my friends, sometimes we fill out those little applications and we find out what gender we are and we see M and we check M and we think that means we're men. Listen to me. Just because you're a male doesn't mean you're a man. Many males here tonight, young males and older males, but God is looking to take boys and make them men. You think God can take a boy and bring a boy from a boy to a man? Paul said, when I was a child, I thought as a child. I understood as a child, I spoke as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Some time ago, these, this little uh, hip-hop group, this little uh, R&B group had a song called What a Man. What a man, what a mighty good man. My friends, they don't know what a man is. They started talking about Denzel and, and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. That's not men. You want to tell me what a real man is? His name is Jesus. Amen. When those people saw him on the boat, the storm was raging, and all of a sudden Jesus, out of his sleep, woke up and solved the problems. He said, peace. And that's a man. Those people looked in the boat and they said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? What type of man is that? My friends, where are those men today? If we want to be men, we have to spend some time with the man Christ Jesus. And the reason today that we have little men is because we haven't spent time with the master. Listen to me. If you're a man, and you don't leave a male and you, leave your, you don't leave your family until morning and even in devotion, you're not a man. Any boy can get a man, a woman pregnant. It takes a man to say no to adultery and fornication. It takes a man to say no to, to keep himself pure. Any boy can go out and sell drugs. Any boy can, can let his wife do all the working for him. But it takes a man to provide for his family. And a man that doesn't provide for his family is worse than an infidel. I said he's worse than an infidel. My brothers and my sisters. I told my wife, from the moment we married, you don't ever have to work a day in your life. I'd rather work two jobs before I wait and make you work. And I had to do it too. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Amen. I said, man must prove himself. Amen. Amen. Never had to work if she didn't have to. She can choose to do what she wants as charity, but not to provide. My brothers and my sisters, if we would treat a woman like she is, she would not want to be like a man. The reason why we have a generation today of women trying to act like men is because men are not being men. Now listen to me. I don't need no help. I just want you to listen right now. Just listen. Because we didn't get to the woman yet. We'll get to the woman. Amen. But right now we're dealing with the men. 
Because if there's no men, there can never be any woman. So my friends, the men think that, that, that they're to be breadwinners. You ever heard that? They say, well, just I just bring money into the house and I do that. But my friends, the Bible says man should not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, our men must study the Bible. They need to know this in their mind and heart. They need to demonstrate it in their home. And they need to show it to their children. And I can tell you something. All I need to do to know if you have a real Christian home is to go to the room of the children. You say, what do you mean? The room of the children. If I go to a child's room and I see pictures of Kobe Bryant and I see a picture of, of, of 50 Cent. And I see a picture of rappers and basketball stars and all the rest. And then a little picture of mommy and daddy. You know who they're trying to be like? Let me tell you something. Young people learn more by what they see than by what you say. You want to clean up the street? Let's get a man. You see, this is the reason our young boys don't know this. This is why prison cells are broken out. But if we have a man, this can stop. The greatest want in the world is the want of men. I want to spend time learning that, don't you? Don't you want to learn to be a man? In fact, the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, as we get ready to bring this message to a close, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 22, let me tell you something. God has always been in search for a man. You see, the greatest desire of God is to be with his people. The Bible says that he shall call his name Emmanuel, which means what? God with us, he wants to be with us. And just before Jesus went away the first time, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will and receive you unto myself. Jesus is coming back, my friends. Jesus is about to come, but you know what he's looking for? Look what the Bible says. In Ezekiel chapter 22, beginning in verse 29, Jesus sees the problems of America. Jesus sees the problems of crime. Do you know that right now in Miami is one of the murder capitals of the world? You know that? You research it. Thefts, rape, prostitution, gambling, drug selling, racketeering. Even in corporate America, right here, embezzlers, politicians losing respect. Doesn't matter what part of society you're from, you call yourself an aristocrat. The Bible calls you a sinner. We're sinners. And the only thing that can help us is a savior. God is looking for men. You see, if God can get the man problem solved, oh, he can fix the woman. If God can get the man problem solved, he can fix the children. The Bible says in Ezekiel 22, as he looks at the problem of this world, the Bible says in verse 29, the people of the land have used what? Oppression. Have exercised robbery. You seen some robbery? Man was going down just a, not long ago. You hear it all the time. Men going down to the ATM, and before he turns around, he's been robbed. And have vexed the poor and the needy. Yea. They have oppressed the stranger wrongfully, but what is God doing? God complaining, God twiddling his thumbs, what is God doing? Verse 30 says, and I what? Saw for a man. What God's looking for from the beginning to the end? He's in search for a man. I saw for a man among them, a man among the wickedness, a man that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. What did you find? You mean to tell me over six billion people, but you couldn't find one man? Oh, he found many males, many males. You don't have problems finding the male. The problem is finding men. The Bible says, I found none. Therefore, have I poured out my indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. The own way have I recompensed upon their heads, said the Lord. My friends, the world's in trouble, and the only thing that can help us is by Jesus looking and making men. Mothers, you have some responsibility in helping make men, don't you? You know that sisters, that you can help make men. 
my brothers and my sisters, I'll never forget reading about a story of this one man. He had lived in a rough life. He had two children, two girls. His wife had left him because the struggle was so great. But that man said, I'm not going to give up on my girls. Later on, they found out the wife died in a car accident. The man was by himself. He did everything for those two girls. He worked at the little small farm that he had. He sent them to the little farm school down the way. He did everything he could to make sure that their care was provided for. He loved them and took care of them. They didn't miss anything. They loved their father. One day the father was out in the field. and His daughters were back at home. And as he was getting ready to turn back to the home, he turned around and looked around and saw smoke coming over from his house. Something had happened. Instantly, he thought, maybe a fire started. What's happening to my girls? He begins running fast as he can toward his house. Goes back toward the house, gets to the house. He doesn't even stop. He just breaks open the door with his arms. It wouldn't open up, and he bangs it down, and inside the house is in flames. Smoke is everywhere. Can't even see what's going on, and he's saying, I wonder where my girls are. They're still alive. He rushes through the house and goes back and forth. Finally, he goes back into a room that looked like it was closed, and he tries to call for his daughters. They didn't answer. He busts through the door. And just before he gets in, he sees the, the, the sides of the doorposts that are flaming in fire. And as, he, as he's opening up the door and busting it through, those flame posts fall down. He grabbed them with his bare hands, threw them to the side, not stopping to think what happened. He looked around, and he saw both of his girls right there, almost over suffocated by the smoke. He reaches down and picks up both his little girls in his arms. And the true story tells us that he took them out of the house and just as he took them out of the house, the building collapsed behind him. But he had saved his girls. That man. Well, the court system and the town found out about what happened. They found out that he lost his house and his farm and everything else. And they said, well, now you can't, you don't have a wife. You can't take care of your kids. You lost everything. We need to give them to DHR. Government needs to take them away. And they took that man to court. The man said, no, I love my kids. I'll do anything to take care of my kids. They said, you can't provide for them. And they said they took him to court. The man went to court and the uh, the attorney wax eloquent. You don't have a job. You don't have money. You don't have a wife. You don't have anything. How can you provide for them? You, are, you should give them up. That man didn't even have enough money to afford a lawyer. As he stood up in the courtroom, as it looked like the case was in the, the, the favor of the government, and they looked like he was getting ready to lose, the man didn't know what else to do, and he said, look, I love my kids. When he lifted up his hand, the whole courtroom saw his hands had been blistered and bleeding. Because he had third degree burns from holding the timber in his hands when he saved his girls. And all of a sudden, the courtroom was in a gasp. <gasps> when the decision was made unanimously, they said that man was willing to give his life. And he deserves those little girls. And they awarded him the girls. What do you say? My, my friends, while that was a true story of man, do you know that Jesus did the same thing for us? Oh, what a man. When it looked like everybody was lost, Jesus put his hand on the cross. And the stains and the marks are still in his hand. And you and I today, we like to look beautiful. We get plastic surgery. But do you know that even in heaven, those marks are going to be in the hands of Jesus? You read it in Zechariah. One little boy is going to come up to Jesus and say, Jesus, where did you get those marks from? He didn't say because of my enemies. He said, it was where I was wounded in the house of my friends. And the great head, Jesus, the great husband of the church, has left an example for the men to follow. I tell you, that's a big shoe to fill, isn't it? And no male can fill that position unless he has Jesus in his heart. You want to become a man? Open your heart to Jesus. He's knocking right now. Ever since the beginning of time, God has been in search for a man. He said he found none back then, but I want him to find one today. What do you say? You going to help make them men, women? Men, you going to help? And let God say, here am I, send me. If you want God to help you to be a man, 
Or if you're a woman, you want God to help you to pray that God will make your husband or your son a man. Or if you're a young man, and you want to pray that God help you to be not a boy, but a man. Only God can take us from a boy and make us a man. If you want to do that, would you reverently stand with me right now? Did you believe what you heard tonight? Do you believe that the greatest one in the world is the one of men tonight? And by standing tonight, you're saying, Lord, I want you to make me a man. If you're a woman, you're saying, Lord, I want you to use me to help my son to become a man. Help my brother to become a man. Help my husband to become a man. Doesn't take a lot of talking about it, but we can pray about it. And if we can pray in this week of prayer for some men to be created in this church, then we will see a revival and a reformation. Don't think about everybody else. Men, let's think about ourselves. What do you say? Let us pray. Oh, Father in heaven, we're so thankful that you love us so much. Father, we haven't been living like men. When we look at the robbery and the oppression and the murder and the filth that are on these streets today, when we look at the young boys that think that gangsters is the only way to be a man, when we look at men who are trapped on pornography, no man looks at pornography, only a boy looks at that. Males look at pornography, men don't look at pornography. Lord, when we see that today, it shows us that we need to become men. Father, I pray that you will free us from the filth that has prevented males from becoming men. Lord, we want, like the Apostle Paul, that we put away the childish things so that we can become men in Christ Jesus. That we can lead our families to morning and evening worships. That we can lead our family in prayer. That we can lead our young men and show them what a man is. That our young brothers can learn not to be a rebellious generation. Our young girls can learn how to be women. Then, Lord, we can have princes and princesses, kings and queens, ready to live in the kingdom of heaven. Father, you're in search for a man. And Father, I pray that you'll bless every male in this room to make us men. Thank you for searching for us, Lord. That as you ask Adam where you are, you didn't leave him, Lord, hiding him, afraid. Men are not afraid like that. You didn't leave him like that. Lord, you gave him a plan of redemption so that Adam could redeem his manhood. And we ask that you'll do that for us today. I just want to ask and make a special appeal. There are men right now that say, Lord, I want to be a man more than I've ever been. Just raise your hand wherever you are. You may be a young man, you may be an older man, but you're just raising your hand and saying, Lord, make me a man like Christ Jesus. Father, you've seen the lifted hands and you've seen the hands that should have been lifted, but that only you can lift. May when the call is made in search for man, may we say, here we are, Lord. Send us. We thank you. May every one of us not be missing tomorrow night. In Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation. My brothers and my sisters, plead. I pray that you'll be praying for these meetings. And spend at least a couple of minutes every day praying that God would bless these meetings. Amen. That nothing will prevent you from coming to this meeting. I'm telling you, it's going to be harder tomorrow. But if you make it up in your mind tonight, not just come yourself, but bring somebody else. Amen. May God bless you. If there are no announcements, you may consider yourself dismissed.